Our first speaker for the for the morning is an old friend who was here last year, Matt Wolf. Mr. Wolf has been a historical reenactor and researcher for over 20 years. Research intended to improve his historical persona led to the publication of his first book, Roberts Rogers Rules for the Ranging Service and an analysis. Three more publications would follow over the next decade, decade. Ranger, North American Frontier Soldier, Volumes 1 and 2, and Henry Bouquet's Destiny, The March to Bushy Run. Match specialty and primary area of interest is the Colonial Ranger of the 17th and 18th centuries in North America. Matt is currently a staff writer for Muzzleloader Magazine, and as I mentioned, was our, one of our speakers at the 217 event. Please add Matt Wolf. Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here uh, again, second year in a row. Uh, evidently, I must have done a fair job last year because they invited me back. <laughs> um, I've got a lot of information on this PowerPoint, uh, and I know that the schedule's really big today, um, so I'll try to get through it as quickly as possible. If we don't have time for questions at the end of the PowerPoint, I'll be here all day all day today and all day tomorrow over in the in the tent uh, please stop by and ask me any questions that you might have um, in case we don't get through them today um, this powerpoint presentation is as well as the book that i wrote on henry bouquet uh, basically started out uh, i was doing research uh, prior to the 250th anniversary of the battle of bushy run uh, we were going to uh, attend the reenactment and I wanted to learn as much as I could about that battle. And I was also very interested in a small group of rangers that Henry Bouquet had enlisted to act as flankers uh, while he made his march towards Fort Pitt. And in the course of studying those rangers, I became introduced to Henry Bouquet. And I can't say enough about this man and his short career here in North America. He was a man far before his time, uh, just a fantastic character. Um, I, I just became fascinated the, the farther on that I, I studied him. Uh, he was born in Switzerland in 1719, a fairly well-to-do family, uh, the town of Roll. He enjoyed a privileged childhood and a fairly good education for the time. Um, it was normal for a lot of, of people of his stature in society to join the military, uh, which he did at the age of 17. Uh, he became a soldier in one of the Swiss professional regiments. Uh, these regiments were often hired out as mercenaries for other countries to fight their wars for them. Uh, he first served in the Dutch Republic, Republic before moving on to serve uh, under the King of Sardinia during the War of Austrian Secession in 1740 through 1748. He achieved the rank of first lieutenant and acted as an adjutant, both of which he, he did with great distinction. Uh, he enjoyed a very uh, good military career, and he was really building a reputation in Europe at this time. Uh, he, catch, he caught the attention of the Duke of Orange uh, head of the Dutch Republic, and he offered uh, Henry a, a position in his Swiss Guards as a, uh, as a captain commander and also as the rank of lieutenant colonel. He was stationed in Hague, the Dutch capital. In this uh, time period of his life, he really kind of set the basis of what he would become later in life. Uh, he used his spare time constantly during the course of his life to continue to try to um, better himself. He was constantly taking classes on mathematics, sciences, other areas that he was interested in, but it was all with the goal of becoming a better soldier. Um, his military training of the day would have been your standard European types of training. 
uh, where they use large formations, mass firings, bayonet charges, and things like that to force your enemy from the field. Also, while he was in Europe at this time, he went on a tour with the Duke of Orange through a lot of the old battlefields uh, back from me medieval Europe. Uh, some of the Roman campaigns and some and, and things like that, which really helped his better understanding of these European formations and how the military tactics at the time started to evolve. Um, while he was improving his knowledge in Europe, the French and Indian War was starting to ignite here in North America. Uh, basically, things came to a head in 1755 when you actually had uh, a defeat of General Braddock here at the Battle of the Mon Monongahela in 1755. Braddock had been sent to drive the French from the forks of the Ohio, Fort Duquesne, uh, to drive them off. Uh, of course, anybody who's a student of Pennsylvania history know uh, that he suffered a horrible defeat and actually lost his life. Uh, during that time period. In order to bolster their military efforts here in North America, and also to help them from Great Britain from having to send huge amounts of regular troops over here to North America, because they were also fighting a conflict in Europe, uh, they came up with an idea that let's go out and let's see if we can go in among the Swiss and the German settlements in Pennsylvania and raise a group that would later be called the Royal American Regiment. Uh, it would be a lot cheaper for the British government to, to build an army of the people who are already here in North America. And they thought that even though they considered them rough North Americans, that if they had trained European soldiers, they could build them into a fighting force. Uh, Sir Jovis, Joseph York, who was an English ambassador to The Hague, recommended Henry Bouquet for a position in this regiment. Uh, he accepted. He was commissioned a lieutenant colonel in the British Army, and he set for sail for North America in 1756. Now, the, the war was pretty much raging by then. Uh, campaigns had already been uh, arranged for 1756. Uh, so he was kind of coming in after the start of the French and Indian War. Uh, upon his arrival in, in Philadelphia in 1756, he formed at first a very poor opinion of the people of Pennsylvania. Uh, as he rode into the city, a farmer struck at him with a whip. Uh, Quaker-dominated Pennsylvania did not like a professional soldier and they were not afraid of showing their disgust for them. Uh, it caused him to say that he detested this cursed city, declaring that the inhabitants were the most detestable creatures that ever produced by nature, even the most odious for all the corruption can add. So it was not a very good start for Henry Bouquet in Pennsylvania. Uh, for the next year, he was basically busy recruiting for his regiment, um, but he enjoyed great success. Being Swiss, the people understood him very well. They understood his goals. And his success among the Swiss and German settlements in Pennsylvania and Maryland was, was very successful. He, he quickly filled his recruiting obligations. Uh, in 1757, he still hadn't seen any big action in the French and Indian War. He was actually sent to Charleston, South Carolina to help bolster the defenses around the ports in South Carolina. Uh, and like I said, so far he hadn't seen any action, but that was about to change. This is an a engraving of Henry Bouquet. It was actually, uh, it's a painting, but uh, they don't know for sure if this was actually him. Uh, a lot of the times they would paint uh, portraits of people that they had never seen or never met but there was money in it. So we don't know if this is him, but pretty much everybody, if you see anything on Henry Bouquet, this painting is gonna show up. Uh, his first action he would see would be, was during the 1758 Forbes campaign. Uh, after suffering Brad Braddock's defeat, the French had established themselves at the forts of the Ohio at Fort Duquesne. 
the British needed to force the, the, the French away from their fortification because the Ohio River was such a vital waterway that allowed them travel from the lakes up in the New England colonies all the way down into the Mississippi River. So in 1757, they made plans to capture that fortress if possible. And they placed Brigadier General John Forbes in command and Henry Bouquet was appointed as second in command. This is a portrait of, of John Forbes. Uh, I believe this one was actually painted from life. Uh, so this is probably a pretty good indication of what Forbes actually looked like. Uh, Bouquet leads the way. John Forbes was a very competent military man and a good choice to lead the campaign. The only problem is he was suffering from some type of a fatal illness. It would eventually kill him. Uh, this left Henry in charge of the shouldering the work burden of a lot of this campaign. Uh, it's not to say Forbes didn't do everything that he could, and you will see, uh, anybody that studies this campaign will see how much work that he was actually doing for as ill as he was at the time. Uh, so Henry was pretty much in charge of building the roads, building the fortifications, training the men, making sure they had enough supplies and everything forward because he was always in advance of the army uh, while General Forbes was back trying to pro uh, procure supplies and things that they needed. Uh, despite his previous impressions of colony in Pennsylvania, uh, his ability to work with anybody uh, soon became evident. Uh, he made a lot of friends in Pennsylvania, including Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he overcame the problems with obtaining food and supplies that were needed for the campaign with, the campaign, with a firm but honest hand. And he earned a respect of the Pennsylvanians. And you actually seen their attitude towards each other start to change. Uh, even as he was overcoming some of these original problems with this campaign, uh, he still faced the task of training the army. A lot of the army uh, that was uh, assembled included British regulars, but it also was made up a lot of provincial troops. A lot of the, these guys had not even seen a musket, let alone trained how to use one in the typical European fashion. Uh, Nonetheless, he was able to assemble a pretty decent fighting force. Uh, but now, once he had his force together, he had his supplies and things, he still had to push his way across Pennsylvania, uh, especially over making a trip over the Appalachian Mountains with supply wagons, military train, and artillery. Uh, and during this time period, he faced two obstacles that he had never faced before. One was the Native American tribes that he would face, and also vast wilderness of North America. North America and Europe were about as far apart as in terms of terrain, woodlands, and things like that as you could be. Uh, Forbes had ordered a line of forts to be, long, to be built along their, their passageways as they made their way towards Fort Duquesne. They didn't want to make the mistake that General Braddock had made. General Braddock basically made his march between two points. Uh, what Forbes wanted to do was build a series of fortifications and supply depots as he made his way across Pennsylvania so that in case they would be attacked or suffer something like happened to General Braddock, they could go back to a supply depot, regroup, and continue on with the campaign. campaign. It was a very, very sound plan, especially trying to make yourself a way across the, the wilderness of Pennsylvania. The problem was, is whenever General Forbes tried to advance behind uh, uh, Bouquet in the advance part of the army, it would really rile up his illness. He, he would be so sick at times, he couldn't ride in a carriage, he couldn't ride a horse. They would actually string two blankets between two horses as like a litter and he would literally be carried across Pennsylvania between two horses like that. That's how ill this man was. Uh, all the while though, his right-hand man, Henry Bouquet, was ahead of him trying to get the job done. 
Uh, this is pretty much the route that they took towards Fort Duquesne. This is the route that Braddock had taken. This is kind of an underlying story in this, in this saga, this campaign. The Virginians were pushing to use the Braddock Road because it would be beneficial to them. Uh, they were fighting not to build a new road across uh, Pennsylvania. Both Bouquet and Forbes didn't care who it was going to benefit. They were interested in their military objective. Uh, the first large fortification that was built uh, along his line of march was a stockade at Raystown, later named as Fort Bedford. Uh, this was going to be the staging area where they would assemble all the soldiers, all the supplies, before they started to push west. Uh, it embraced a 7,000 square yard area. It had five bastions built in the, in the style of a European fortification. Uh, large areas for swivel guns and things like that, although it was built uh, as a stockade, which was common in North America. Uh, this is a period illustration of Fort uh, Bedford. And you'll notice whenever they march, uh, they normally use waterways as much as they can. And not only that, does it make it easier to supply a campaign, it also uh, gives them a source of water, but it also protects from the enemy using that same waterway. So you always, you will normally see when they build a fortification, it's not just a good spot of land to build it on, it has a military purpose. While on the march to Fort De Duquesne, two events would uh, occur that uh, would affect how Colonel Bouquet would conduct his military campaigns in the future. Uh, the first one was Grant's defeat in the Battle of Loyal Hannon. Uh, Henry would show an amazing ability during the course of his career to adapt to things that he hadn't seen before in attacks such as these. Uh, and he was also able to make decisions very quickly. Bouquet and an advance force of about 1,500 men had reached a place called Loyal Hannon in early September. Here he began, began, began the construction of the last fortification that they would have in place before they made their final push to, towards Fort Duquesne. Uh, it was originally intended to be a winter garrison. Uh, the campaign had got off to a really slow start. They didn't think that they were going to be able to make, meet their objective before winter set in and put a halt to the campaign. Uh, because they just didn't think they were going to get the, the job done in 1758. Um, General Forbes himself felt that it was getting very, very late in the season and that they wouldn't be able to, to continue their march against Fort Duquesne. Supplies were getting harder to get that far out on the wilderness, uh, out to these fortifications and things like that. Uh, you will see that a lot through 18th century military history that you get so late in the season that you just can't move your men anymore. Uh, this is a really great painting uh, by one of uh, our esteemed artists that are here uh, this, this weekend. And what it does is it shows members of the Royal American Regiment uh, they're basically taking a break from their march along the, the Forbes Road uh, in the heat of the day. Uh, just beautiful. It really captures the countryside that anybody who lives in Pennsylvania, you've seen, you know, places like this time and time again. Just a, just a wonderful painting, you know, showing some of the reality of, of this campaign. Uh, this is... Fort, the entrenched camp at Fort Ligonier, this is the last post that he built. Uh, if anybody has ever been to the Fort at Ligonier here in Pennsylvania, it, you know what a wonderful site it is. If you haven't, I highly recommend that you go there. The museum is wonderful, and the fort itself is fantastic. Um, basically, this shows the construction of the fort, uh, the retrenched camp where some of the troops were stayed. Uh, Gar uh, stationed because there wasn't enough room to garrison everybody inside the fortification and also uh, some of your provincial uh, troops, places for cattle, things like that, things that a lot of people don't think of during a military campaign. Uh, 
while Bouquet was busy uh, making sure that uh, Fort Lugineer was being built, uh, he was also uh, trying to get his artillery moved forward. Uh, Major James Grant of the 77th Regiment began to pressure him. He wanted to go and make a sortie against Fort Duquesne. They wanted to try to see what kind of strength uh, the French forces had there. Um, Grant was also kind of looking to make a name for himself. Uh, he finally, against probably his better judgment, he allowed uh, Grant to uh, advance towards Fort Duquesne with a force of 850 men. Uh, he basically wanted to see if he could lure the French out and defeat them without having to attack this fortification. Uh, the French really weren't having any of it. Uh, he tried to send some scouting uh, forces towards the, the, the French fortification, see if he could get them out, you know, get them to come out. And, uh, you know, they burnt some storehouses and things like that, but the French just, they, they weren't coming out of hiding. And, and Grant kind of probably should have backed off right then, but he didn't. Uh, the next morning, he, he marched up to the fort, flags flying, drums beating, uh, hoping to draw them out. Uh, he was hoping to actually draw them out into an ambush, the same thing that the French and the natives would, would do the British forces whenever ever they could. Uh, he had his piece, his, his main ambush set up on a piece of ground that is still known as Grant's Hill today because of this defeat. Uh, the only problem is the French force, uh, according to their initial intelligence, was supposed to be very small and very ill-supplied, uh, but they weren't. It was much larger than had been reported. They had a very large contingent of native warriors on hand. Um, they actually suddenly streamed out of the fort and overran his forces before they could make it back to the ambush site as planned. Uh, Major Andrew Lewis rushed forward with a force of Virginia Provincials and probably uh, allowed this battle to turn out better than it was. I mean, it was really a rout of the English forces. Um, he actually helped a lot of the men, uh, you know, to, to be able to escape and make their way back towards Fort Ligonier. They moved very swiftly, and it was kind of a one-sided victory. Uh, the Indians used the forest to their advantage. Concealed by the thick foliage, their heavy and destructive fire could not be returned with any effect. Uh, the English forces suffered 342 casualties out of that 850-man force, 232 from uh, the 77th alone. Uh, many people were, were captured, including Grant and Major Lewis. Uh, the rest of the English forces were able to make it back to Fort Ligonier, but Grant, in his own words, had said he went from a prepared for position with nothing to fear to position to where in less than an hour he was fired upon from every quarter. Uh, he got a quick lesson in how well the French and the natives were able to engulf a force of troops. Uh, this is this is a painting. A lot of you uh, that have visited Fort Pitt might see it hanging in the walls. Uh, it shows the real confusion, uh, this watercolor of what happened at Grant's defeat. Uh, the natives just simply engulf your position if possible. Hoping to expand on their victory over Major Grant, at first, they expected that this may force the British to abandon the campaign period. But uh, when that didn't happen, hoping to push the English even more, uh, the camp at Loyal Hannon or Fort Ligonier was attacked in October by a large force of French and, and Allied natives. They were hoping to actually steal a great quantity of supplies from the English that they vitally needed at Fort Duquesne. But they were also hoping that if they could slow down the advance enough that they would force them into the winter quarters that the English were already considering to do. Um, the men were busy uh, outside the fort trying to finish the fortifications. 
uh, they were dispersed almost a mile and a half from the, the, the fortification itself. Uh, they attacked these guards first, inflicting heavy casualties. Uh, provincial troops in Maryland from Maryland and Pennsylvania were sent out to the fort to try to repel these invaders, but they were forced to retreat back to the, the fort also. Uh, artillery fire from the fort finally drove the attackers back. It was a good thing that they had been pushing these supplies and their artillery forward or Fort Ligonier may have never seen the light of day. It may have been burned to the ground during this attack. Um, they made another attempt that failed to overrun of the fort's defensive bastions. Uh, the enemy kept up a sporadic fire uh, during the course of the day, but uh, by morning they had withdrawn back to Fort Duquesne. Uh, and like I said, they had hoped that they had stopped enough of the English advance that maybe they would be safe for another, another year. Uh, this is another great painting. Uh, you can see Fort Ligonier the huge amounts of tents of camp and in the retrench camp. And the French are actually dropping their packs uh, and their baggage before they make that a attack on the outskirts of the, of the fortifications. <laughs> Bouquet realizes he wasn't here at Fort Ligonier at the time. He was back trying to forward even more of his artillery. Uh, but he realizes that right now that the French have the upper hand when it comes to warfare on the Pennsylvania frontier. Uh, they lost a large number of livestock, including horses, which were vital for getting their supplies forward. Um, the English forces didn't, you didn't lose a lot of uh, casualties. 12 ki killed, 18 wounded, thir 31 missing. Uh, but he was very, even though the fort was not allowed to be overrun, he was very unhappy with how things happened. Uh, this enterprise, which should have cost the enemy dearly, shows a great deal of contempt for us, and the behavior of our troops in the woods justifies their idea only too well. He knew that right now the tactics that they were using, they were outgunned. Uh, and for now, the French had succeeded in grinding the campaign to a halt. Uh, General Forbes had finally advanced to Fort Ligonier by the 2nd of November, which is very, very late in the campaign season to be conducting any, any operations against uh, the French. Uh, and he actually began to make preparations to garrison his, port, his post and make his way back to Philadelphia. They were going to suspend this campaign in, in 58 and then try to pick it back up the, the following year. Uh, the only problem is the French lost a lot of their native warriors after Grant's defeat and also the attack at Loyal Hannon. Uh, that left uh, the commander, uh, Francis Lingery, commander at Fort du Duquesne with less than 600 men to face uh, Forbes' army. Uh, Forbes acted on this information. This was one of the only things that came out of the attack on Fort Ligonier that was beneficial. They captured a couple prisoners who revealed this information to General Forbes and Colonel Bouquet that the French were actually pretty weak at Duquesne now uh, because of the, the, the number of natives that they had lost after Grant's defeat and that he was very poorly supplied. So. Forbes made a quick decision. He was going to go ahead and advance on Fort Duquesne, even though he was, uh, it was very late in the season and he was very sick. He decided that uh, he was going to attempt to, to take the fort anyhow. Uh, the French, knowing that they couldn't withstand a siege against their post, uh, withdrew during the night on the 26th of November, uh, basically destroyed the fortifications as much as they could. Uh, but even though they were standing in, in the smoldering ruins of a, a French fortification, uh, the English now controlled the vital forks of the Ohio River. Uh, it gave them a real foothold in the Ohio country. General Forbes would return to Philadelphia where he would eventually die of his illness. Uh, Colonel Bouquet was left behind to secure the gains that they had made. Um, 
including the building of a new English fortification there at the Forks of the Ohio, which would later be called Fort Pitt. Uh, in 1759, the French also abandoned their other posts in Pennsylvania, uh, Venego, uh, LaBeouf, and uh, Presque Isle. Uh, in 1759, Henry would actually lead a small detachment up through Pennsylvania to re-secure those posts. What they wanted to do was control the portage route between Lake Erie and the Ohio River at Fort Pitt. Um, it was really the beginning of the end. French had lost their foothold in Pennsylvania. Uh, they would lose their position at Fort Niagara in 1759. Um, Fort Ticonderoga in 1759. Uh, most of their fortifications, except for Montreal, had been captured by this time. Uh, France would surrender in 1760 and basically give up their holdings in North America. Uh, this was the new fortification at the point. Uh, fort Duquesne was in this area. This is a new fort pit that is, is built. If anybody's been there to that museum, a wonderful site also. So things were kind of quiet for a few years uh, following the end of the, the active campaigning during the French and Indian War. But in 1763, a native rebellion exploded along the English frontier, which is what this weekend is about. Uh, fueled by Indian policies put in place by General Jeffrey Amherst that among other things severely amounted, limited to the amount of ammunition the natives could buy from English traders, a confederacy of tribes began to come together to try to see if they could expel the English from their lands. Uh, Fort Sandusky, Fort St. Joseph, Fort Miami, Fort uh, Wiatnon, and Fort Michilimackinac would all fall to native attack or be abandoned. The new post at Presque Isle, the Boeuf, and Venego were also captured and burned. The natives tried to uh, surprise the garrison at Fort Detroit, but the planned attack was discovered and prevented. And uh, native, under, native forces under the Ottawa War Chief Pontiac lay siege to Detroit on the 10th of May. Uh, this is a, uh, another great painting uh, showing uh, the planning stages of the attack, uh, the attack at Fort Michel Mackinac up by the Straits of uh, Michigan. Uh, they, they used subterfuge in order to gain access to inside the fort massacred the garrison, captured most of them. Uh, it was just one of the, the strategic points that the natives had attacked during the early parts of the rebellion. Fort Pitt was put under siege. A contingent of natives appeared before Fort Pitt and demanded its surrender from Captain Simeon Ecuer. Uh, Colonel Bouquet was the actual commandant at Fort Pitt at the time, but he was back in Philadelphia. Uh, Ecuador, of course, refused, and the fort was too strong to take by direct assault. Uh, the natives began to lay siege to the post on the 22nd of June, which was something that the natives just didn't do. Uh, they didn't really have the resources, artillery, and things like that to uh, lay siege to a fortification uh, in a typical European fashion, but if they could starve the garrison at Fort Pitt into surrendering, that was their goal. Uh, raiding parties began to, to savage the frontier at this time. Uh, Pennsylvania frontier really bore the, the, the brunt of these attacks. General Amherst at first reacted very slowly. Um, a lot of his correspondence, you will notice that he has a, he doesn't realize how good of a fighting force that the Native Americans can actually be if they're organized. Uh, he doesn't feel that they're strong enough to overcome a highly trained professional force or the British Army. Uh, up to this point, Amherst had enjoyed really a sterling reputation in North America, but uh, his kind of slow response to the initial news that there might be a native rebellion going on kind of tarnished his, his reputation for the rest of his life. Uh, this is an actual painting of, of Jeffrey Amherst. He was actually knighted. 
uh, like I said, exemplary uh, military uh, <coughs> reputation and uh, career, except for his slow response to Pontiac's Rebellion. Uh, Amherst decided that uh, after he finally realized the scope of the rebellion, that uh, he needed to relieve Fort Detroit and also to relieve Fort Pitt. Uh, so he assembled two relief columns uh, to go in relief of these posts, try to raise the sieges. Uh, the first was placed under uh, Captain James Dalyell. Uh, he was to try to relieve Fort Detroit. Uh, these would be assembled at Fort Niagara for the, for the push to, towards Detroit. And uh, for the exhibition, expedition to relieve Fort Pitt, Amherst chose Henry Bouquet, which was pretty natural since his, his service during the, the Forbes campaign. Uh, he couldn't have made a better choice. Uh, he was very familiar with the area. Uh, he was very familiar with the native style of fighting by now. Uh, the knowledge that he had gained in his previous campaign made him the natural choice. And uh, he had also really begun to show uh, an ability to adapt, to change his formations, to change his tactics and things like that, to better enable his troops to face the type of warriors and uh, the, the warriors and their tactics that he was going to face on this campaign. Uh, Amherst was still un underestimating the size of the rebellion. At first, he only called up two companies of light infantry, one from the 42nd and one from the 77th, uh, which would then be placed under Bouquet's command once they made it to Pennsylvania. Uh, two companies, normally 100 men uh, per company, they were probably very under strength. Uh, so it kind of gives you an insight of how little respect that he had for the what he thought was going on. Uh, although I thought proper to assemble this force, which I judge more than sufficient to quell any disturbances the whole Indian strength could raise, yet I am persuaded this alarm will end in nothing more than a rash attempt of what the Senecas have been threatening and of which we have heard of for some time past. The post of Fort Pitt or any others commanded by officers can certainly never be in danger from such a wretched enemy as the Indians are at this time if the garrisons do their duty. So you can tell he just didn't think that they weren't going to lose a post. There's no way the natives were going to be able to make any inroads. Uh, Bouquet, on the other hand, acts very quickly. Uh, he will march his army along the Forbes Road again. He knows that area. He knows what they went through. He knows what to expect. Uh, thinking ahead, he requ requests sturdy bags to be made. He knew during the Forbes campaign that the roads were very bad for wagons and large uh, military trains to, to try to follow. Uh, he's thinking ahead for the farther that he gets along on his campaign that he might have to abandon his wagons. Uh, in Fort Pitt, while a very formidable post, is in no shape to withstand a siege, uh, even one conducted by natives. The garrison consisted only a, of 145 men, plus the spring flood had badly damaged a lot of the fortifications. Uh, and also, it had also damaged a great quantity of the provisions and supplies that were on hand, so they were in bad shape to start with uh, before they were placed under siege. Uh, first of all, Bouquet has to get the, the supplies that he needs for this campaign, especially wagons and horses. Uh, food is scarce in, in Pennsylvania at this time. Uh, plus, he was just in a, in a bad way to get men and supplies. Everything he needed for the, this campaign, he faced hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. Uh, where for the present, had I just received some pressing requests from the frontier for ammunition and arms, not only was it hard for him to get supplies, the, the frontier of, the, of Pennsylvania was nearly destitute of a lot of these items. Uh, this is a, another great painting. Uh, he's assembling his forces to try to make a march to Fort Pitt. 
the wagons, horses, the men, you can see it's kind of a jumbled mess. So it kind of gives you an idea of, of what you got to try to bring together for a campaign like this. Uh, notwithstanding these problems, he made uh, pretty quick progress. Uh, the colony's assembly, at his request, set 90 men to reinforce Fort, Fort, reinforce Fort Augusta. Uh, information concerning the natives, uh, it, it right now was just too thin to have him really make any, any big choices. But he knew that if he could garrison his posts that, that were there, uh, it was a good thing to do. Uh, we are too much in the dark to take yet any measures besides securing our forts. Uh, you can see his understanding of what he needs to do is continually developing. Uh, the English colonies were asked to help raise troops. Uh, the British Army at this time had 8,000 men in North America approximately. Uh, but when the rebellion broke out, less than 500 were stationed out along the frontiers where they were really needed uh, to meet this threat. Uh, Bouquet, you can again see him thinking by making this suggestion to General Amherst. Uh, should the province raise troops, permit me to submit to you whether they would be not more of service on this occasion, on this occasion if formed into ranger companies uh, composed of hunters and woodsmen who may be on the frontiers, be, be had on the frontiers of this province, but, but particularly those of Maryland and Virginia. From the Forbes campaign, uh, if he was going to get any provincial troops to help him on this campaign, uh, Colonel Bouquet knew exactly the type of men that he was looking for. He needed woodsmen uh, that were used to traveling in the wilderness in North America and also knew how to fight Native Americans. Uh, General Amherst, for all his faults in reacting to the news of the rebellion, showed a lot of faith in Bouquet uh, and basically pretty much gave him free reign to do what he wanted. Uh, the province, provincials that may be furnished on this occasion, if put under your command, you can always employ as you judge best, either as rangers or woodsmen. He basically was going to let Bouquet take the reins on this campaign. Uh, Pennsylvania agreed to raise 700 men's, men, but they were not going to be used on this campaign. They were going to be used for the defense of the colony. At first, you would think, you know, Pennsylvania, he's going to take the threat away from you, but the ravages that were happening along the frontier at the time, you can kind of see their point why they don't want these men to be going out on a campaign. Uh, for the most part, Pennsylvania provincial forces consisted of recent, recent immigrants, further indentured servants, and common laborers who had little or no uh, military experience. Uh, so they really weren't the type of guys that Bouquet was looking for. Again, he wanted his hardened woodsmen. Uh, he was able to employ 50 volunteers for Virginia. Uh, they were going to be used as Teamsters and pack horse drivers. He still had it in the back of his mind that he was going to have to abandon his wagons. Uh, and even though they were still clinging to hope at some of these posts, because they hadn't had any news from a lot of these, these posts that the natives had attacked and, and uh, forced to abandon or surrender, uh, General Amherst began to realize that he was facing a full-scale native war. So he ordered the remaining troops uh, that remained on Staten, I on Staten Island, uh, 171 soldiers from the 42nd and 102 from the 77th to begin their march to Carlisle. They wanted to link it. He wanted to strengthen Bouquet's forces. Uh, contingent of Bouquet's own Royal Americans would round out the soldiers at his disposal, but it was far less than probably what he needed. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the Highland soldiers that were sent to Bouquet had recently returned from the Havana campaigns uh, from the end of the, uh, even though the hostilities had, had stopped here in 1760 in North America, they were still war raging in Europe. And a lot of these guys had come back deathly sick. Uh, malaria had killed hundreds of their com uh, comrades during these campaigns. And so basically it was an invalid army that Bouquet would try to rescue Fort Pitt with. The country was seized by panic at the time. Like I said, they were getting hammered by native attacks on along the frontier. A general panic has seized this extensive country and made the inhabitants abandon their farms and their mills. 
The agent employed by the contractors could not on that account provide the carriages and provisions that I had ordered to be ready for the 28th instant. And I have been, been obliged back to send back to Lancaster for flowers and wagons, which I expect will be here about the 8th of July, which I shall proceed forthwith to Fort Pitt. Bouquet is, is, is hampered by what you see with almost every campaign. We want to start out in May. They start out in June or July because they just can't get supplies and men together. Uh, this is a nice uh, uh, engraving showing a typical attack on a frontier cabin. Uh, even though some, a lot of times your, your, your dress and your weaponry and natives may not be accurate. Uh, it's, it's, it really shows the typical surprise attack that they would use against a, an isolated uh, homestead like this. Uh, a secure line of march, not only behind him, but in front as well. Bouquet learned a lot from that 1758 Forbes campaign. He took great pains to secure his line of march. Uh, but now, knowing that as he advanced across Pennsylvania and there might be a native contingency waiting to attack him anywhere, he uh, sought to make sure that that line in front of him was strengthened as well behind him. Uh, tomorrow morning, a, mo a party of two officers and 30 men with a guide will march for Bedford from once there to proceed with some woodsmen acquainted to, with the country to Fort Ligonier. He wanted to make sure that his posts in front of him were secure. He wanted to make sure that he was getting as much information about what he was going to face as he made his way across Pennsylvania. It was just information that he vitally needed if he was going to succeed. And even though he was trying to push things along, he showed a lot of patience. Uh, even though Fort Pitt was under siege, Captain Ecuwer was still able to send dispatches out from time to time, uh, informing Bouquet of the situation there at the, at the post. Uh, food was limited, but he had enough on hand to last a little while longer, if only he could get relieved. Uh, Ecuwer was probably the perfect person to have at the post at the time. He was another quick thinker. Uh, another man who could adapt. Uh, he took all the civilians that he had that were able to bear arms. Uh, he issued them tomahawks and firelocks, and they were formed into militia uh, units in order to augment his garrison. Uh, so Fort Pitt's in trouble, but they've got the right man there for the job. Finally, uh, at this time, the supplies, the wagons, the things that uh, Henry Bouquet needed to make his push towards uh, Fort Pitt had been uh, assembled. Uh, 60,000 pounds of flour, uh, 32 barrels of gunpowder, 20 sheep and 100 head of uh, cattle had been would be driven along to feed his army as well as to feed the garrison at Fort Pitt once they got there. Uh, Captain Robertson had reached Fort Bedford by the 13th of July and expressed his dismay at the condition of the old Forbes Road. I'm afraid that wagons will find a great deal of difficulty in getting over Sidling Hill, the roads being very broke and much out of repair. Uh, Bouquet had also sent 30 men from the 42nd and the 77th to reinforce the garrison at Fort Ligonier until his arrival. Uh, from there, he would make his final push. Things like this you stop and think about those bags that Henry Bouquet had, had made earlier. That Forbes campaign taught him he knew what he was going to need. Uh, the excessive heat, bad roads, and immense loads of forage made uh, Bouquet's march across Pennsylvania a grueling experience. The command moved slowly, and Bouquet was forced to carry some of the sick Highlanders in the wagons. So again, he was basically operating with an uh, invalid army. Uh, these condition ruined, conditions ruined men, horses, and wagons, cattle. It was, it was utterly devastating on these people making this march. Uh, they reached Fort Bedford on the 25th of July. Uh, as he was making his way, he became increasingly uneasy about being attacked. Uh, the British Army had begun to make great strides in, in utilizing light infantry companies. Uh, but the regular soldier still had his hands tied 
in trying to face uh, a Native American warrior in the woods. Uh, and he knew that the regular firings and formations were just no match for, uh, for, for what he was going to face. His troops were just not prepared for it yet. Uh, this is actually a, a photograph that was done at Bushy Run a couple years ago, uh, showing a typical contingent of uh, regular troops marching along. Uh, just a good indication of how these guys would have been making their way across Pennsylvania. Uh, some of the roads were horrible. You can imagine trying to walk through grass. It's way steep at times. Uh, British regulars, despite the circumstances of campaigning in dense forests, were trained to fire in volleys or by platoons. While this tended to deliver maximum firepower, it proved to be pra practically useless against an enemy concealed behind trees or crouching among the bushes. At the same time, for the red, Redcoats to detonate their blistering volleys, they needed to be in open file, exposing them as targets to the enemy. So this is a good quote of how the power of the British Army was always used, but how here in North America it needed to be adapted in order to be used more useful. Uh, he was particularly susceptible to attack on his flanks, a favorite tactic of the native tribes. He spread his Highlanders out on his flanks, hoping to, to be able to protect them. But given this task to troops who are unfamiliar with the territory, it just proved too great for these, these Scottish warriors. Uh, he, he states that I labor under a great disadvantage for one of men used to the woods, as I cannot send a Highlander out of my sight without running the risk of losing the man which exposes me to surprise from the skulking villains I have to deal with. Very, very nervous about being uh, attacked. Uh, another, another great photograph showing some of the Highland troops marching along. Uh, this was also at the Bushy Run 250th reenactment. Uh, while rushing his men and animals at Fort Bedford, uh, Bouquet did receive a, a, a welcome addition to his forces. Uh, 14 Rangers under the command of Captain Lemuel Barrett had enlisted at Fort, Bedford, or Fort Cumberland and soon joined him at Bedford. Uh, Barrett's men were considered to be local boys. Most had lived for years in the Cumberland Valley and were well suited for this task that he had for them. Uh, this is a bit of vanity on me. <laughs> this is a friend of mine and I, uh, we were taking this picture. Uh, we were trying to show what a typical uh, Pennsylvania Ranger at the time period may have looked like. Uh, so that's my own little toot my horn. <laughs> uh, several documents pertaining to Captain Barrett and his Rangers from the Fort Pitt relief campaign still survive. Uh, the first is the original enlistment roster, uh, roster written at Fort Cumberland. And the second shows the enlistment and discharge dates. Uh, as well as a request to draw out ammunition and provisions for his men while they were at Fort Bedford. Uh, things like this are, are just fantastic when, when they can be found. Um, this is the original enlistment that, that Barrett put together, showing the 14 Rangers that he enlisted. You can tell that this was probably done in a big hurry uh, on whatever scrap of paper that he could find, even though it's in bad shape for the age that it, it, that it is. Uh, this one's a little bit uh, better done. This shows the men that were enlisted, what they were paid. Uh, one of the Rangers was killed in action and gives the date. This was a request for supplies and ammunition uh, that was uh, requested at Fort Bedford before they made their way, or Fort Cumberland before they made their way to Ligonier uh, to join Bouquet. And this is just another good example of how paper was very dear on the frontier. They've, they've written other things on it as well. Uh, during the French and Indian War, the British Army had been, begun to equip the 10 best marksmen in each one of their companies uh, with rifles, while the remaining 90 still carried smoothbore muskets. This had not really changed by the time of Pontiac's Rebellion, but uh, Bouquet, in his written commission to Lemuel, Lemuel Barrett, asked that his men specifically equip themselves with rifles. Uh, and I was very lucky uh, after I wrote my first article for Muzzleloader on Lemuel Barrett's Rangers, a descendant of Lemuel Barrett actually has that original co commission from Bouquet. Um, 
And this is actually what it says. You are hereby authorized to engage 30 woodsmen. Beth, you lost me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're okay. Uh, 30 woodsmen or hunters to march with the troops under my command to Fort Pitt and be employed as rangers or the other way as His Majesty's service may require. Uh, they will receive 45 shillings Pennsylvania currency per month besides the King's provisions uh, while they are continued in the said service and in the case the province of Pennsylvania should hereafter raise troops. These said rangers are to furnish themselves each with a good rifle and ammunition to serve them to Ligonier. And this is actually the original commission, uh, like I said, owned by one of Barrett's descendants. Uh, even though we would now have rangers on his flanks, uh, his column of men could still be susceptible to an attack or an ambush. And uh, so Bouquet began to advise his men how to react if this, should, if this should happen. Should the savages attempt to molest you on your march, you would charge them briskly and not suffer the soldiers to throw away their fire till they have routed them. Uh, Bouquet was act actually advocating that they push at them with uh, bayonets. Uh, which is really funny because during the Forbes campaign, he actually has a quote where he wishes that his men needed nothing except for bayonets, which he considered to be useless in the woods. Uh, he was very careful how he assembled his army as he marched uh, in order to try to avoid that possibility of being ambushed. Uh, General Braddock had done this in a typical European fashion, which actually wasn't too bad. Uh, even though he was defeated, but Bouquet began to uh, expand on this. He placed each unit to where it would have maximum effect and protect his colony as much as he could. Uh, the next diagram is actually uh, one from his march into the Ohio in 1764 after the Battle of Bushy Run. Uh, but it really kind of shows some of the lessons that he learned um, how to place his troops with flankers uh, protecting his baggage and his cattle and things like that. Uh, very interesting to see how such a forward thinker this man was. Uh, there were two schools of thought at this time of what the best formation was to form if you were attacked in the woods. Um, it was thought best to form the men into a square or a circle formation if a square wasn't practical. Uh, this was in response to the natives' methods of attacking down both flanks very quickly. Uh, usually the natives would leave a small opening in the back of a formation. They actually wanted you to give you a, an option of retreating. It placed less uh, chance of them losing men to the fire from the enemy and increased the amount of plunder that they might be able to take. Uh, so this shows a square formation with outlying defensive positions, and the X circle is, is your natives having you surrounded. And this is a revised uh, sketch that they had done. Um, these were all formations that he expected his men to be able to, to fall into quickly if they were attacked while on the march. Uh, when it came to time to camp at the night, he was very good about making a very defensible fortification around his encampment. Uh, he used his baggage train, bag flour, uh, anything that he could to build redoubts and other protrusion in his defenses that would allow him to withstand a, a sudden surprise attack on his encampment. Uh, livestock were often put in the center because it was vital to protect that resource and that supply, along also with any of his ill men uh, this is one of the dispositions of the camp that he came up with. And you can see that the defenses gradually get stronger towards the center. He not only expected to be attacked, he actually wanted to be attacked. Uh, that's why he was so afraid about making sure that he was conducting a secure march. Um, he actually made this statement, I shall do what I can to indict the enemy Indians to march against me. He wanted them to come from Fort Pitt and attack him on his march. He thought that he was going to be secure enough in what his preparations had been 
that, that way he would actually be able to bring them out in the open and, and try to bring a battle about. That was his plan. Um, communication with Fort Pitt, Pitt began to dwindle uh, as messengers were captured or killed. Uh, the natives were starting to tighten their circle around the fortification. Uh, on the afternoon of the 28th, they attacked us very sharply and from very nearby. The whole side of the lower town was under fire. The garden of Mr. Rusbridge behind our brick barrier is short up to where Captain Bassett's house, and short up to where Captain Bassett's house was. They were all well covered just as we were. They're starting to put a little bit more pressure trying to get them, the, the garrison of Fort Pitt to surrender. Uh, food was really running low by then. With so many more mouths to feed because of all the inhabitants that had gone into Fort Pitt trying to seek ref refuge from the attacks along the frontier, uh, the fort's food supplies were starting to run very low. I have at present four hams and no flour, bringing a quantity of it for our jaws, we'll, or our jaws will be empty. Nothing with which to moisten our throats. That was from Captain Eckier during the siege. And this is just before the Battle of Bushy Run occurred. So Henry was getting closer. Time was running out for Fort Pitt. Uh, realizing with this uh, dispatch that was able to make it to him, uh, he decided he needed to move quicker. He left all his wagons at Fort Ligonier, and he wanted to proceed with pack horses now with those bags of flour, bags of ammunition, uh, to speed his column along. The second instant, the troops and convoy arrived at Ligon Air where it could obtain no intelligence of the enemy. Their press expresses since the beginning of July having been either killed or obliged to return, all the passes being occupied by the enemy. In this uncertainty, I determined to leave all the wagons with powder and a quantity of stores and provisions at Ligon Air, and on the 4th proceeded with the troops and about 340, with the troops and about 340 horses loaded with the flour. He was gonna to try to get there as quick as he can. This is one of the storehouses at Fort Ligonier uh, showing a stock of, of flower bags. This would have been pretty much what Henry would have taken on the pack horses towards uh, the relief of Fort Pitt. So he's making his way across uh, Pennsylvania, again along the Forbes Road. He's very familiar with this area. On the 5th of August, he intended to march that day about 17 miles and stop at Bushy Run Station, uh, where his men and the pack horses could rest and refresh themselves near the stream there before making a night march over Port Turtle Creek. The creek there passed between a set of hills, and it was there that Bouquet expected to meet the ambush that he had missed, uh, that he had feared for so many miles. Again, being familiar with that area, he knew that was going to be a prime spot for the ambush. Uh, this is an aerial view of present-day battlefield at, at uh, Fort Bushy Run. Uh, this is Edge, Edge, Edge um, Hill. This is where he constructed his flower bag fort on the end of the first day. Uh, down here by the new uh, monument uh, was where the initial uh, attack was gone. We know in this area approximately he buried some of his dead after the, after the second day of the battle. Uh, this is a section of Bushy Run Creek. Um, this is what his men were marching for that day. Uh, it was very hot, typical August day. Uh, they were really looking forward to a nice cold drink from Bushy Run. Uh, the heat of a typical August day had begun to play in Bouquet's column as they made their way to Bushy Run. He began to spread out. Uh, the column was almost a half a mile long uh, as they had marched in the oppressive heat. Uh, the exhausted soldiers were, were thinking of nothing more than a cold drink of water uh, and to rest their tired feet. Lieutenant James Dow of the Royal Americans was leading the advance guard while the Rangers were on his flanks. Uh, on, the, on the left and right as they were getting close to Bushy Run Creek. Suddenly, about one o'clock in the afternoon, the advance guard was fired upon from the nearby hills. They were quickly, quickly supported by two co uh, companies of light uh, troops from the 42nd. They were able to push the, the enemy from their ambush location, but they were quickly uh, forced to withdraw 
as a native forces counterattack. Uh, the natives seem to be everywhere, attacking in one spot, driven back, then appearing just as quickly in another. It was quickly turning into chaos. Uh, they were quickly able to surround the flanks uh, of Bouquet's men and started to threaten his pack horse train in the rear of his columns. Uh, the action became general. Uh, he actually lost three, 60 men, killed or wounded, including two of his senior officers, uh, Captain Lieutenant Graham uh, and Lieutenant James McIntosh of the 42nd, uh, killed in that initial day's, first day's battle. Uh, Barris Rangers had thrown down their bank, blankets and their packs, and they held the end of being bay as long as they could on the flanks until they were driven uh, back also. They were unable to recover the things uh, that they had thrown down uh, because uh, later that year he actually wrote a letter to Captain Bouquet uh, asking him help in getting his men reimbursed for the blankets and things that they lost. Uh, this is a great Robert Griffin painting uh, showing the battle at uh, Bushy Run. You can see the pack train up in here at the end of the column. These natives here have attacked. They're being repelled with a bayonet charge. Uh, you can see some of his troops here are trying to volley fire. He has other troops in, re in reserve. You have other natives over in this area are starting to attack. If you could have taken a picture of the battle, I think uh, Bob got this about as good as he could. It just shows the chaos that was going on that day. Uh, he was eventually push, pushed back. He was afraid that they were gonna take over his, his pack train. He was gonna lose those vital supplies that he was trying to make, you know, make it with to Fort Pitt. Uh, so he went back and he uh, retreated to a piece of high ground. It's called Edge Hill now. Uh, there he instructed his officers to have the men construct a barricade out of the flower bags in a circular formation. Again, the things that he had planned prior to this campaign and during the campaign, he was starting to use. Uh, he placed a circle inside the wounded and just outside the circle, his livestock. Uh, and finally, he had his men form, his troops form a defensive perimeter. Uh, and that's how it lasted for that entire first day. Natives constantly sniping his formation, making hit and run attacks, coming in, striking, falling back just as quickly as, as, as they were there. Uh, it was really a, a horrible day for Bouquet. Uh, this is a, uh, an, a drawing that was done a few days later after the battle uh, by Thomas Hutchings, who was actually at Fort Pitt during the siege. <laughs> And it shows Bouquet's um, defensive position on Edge Hill and the formation of his men and the natives surrounding him. Uh, that evening, after the firing had died down, uh, Bouquet tried to get a dispatch out to General Amherst, uh, informing him of the am ambush, his losses, and his present situation. He basically advises Amherst to make plans to come up with a new, a new relief for Fort Pitt. He expects the attack to be renewed in the morning and he doesn't expect to survive. You can tell from his letter uh, that his situation was truly desperate. They were out of water up there. Uh, he had many men wounded. Horses and sheep and cattle had been killed. Uh, it had to have been a horrible, horrible night that they spent up on Edge Hill. Whatever our fate may be, I thought it necessary to give Your Excellency this early information that you may, at all events, take such measure as you think to provide the provinces with their own safety and the effectual relief of Fort Pitt. As in the case of another engagement, I fear insurmountable uh, difficulties in protecting and transporting of our provisions being already so much weakened by the losses of this day in men and horses, besides the additional necessity of carrying the wounded, whose situation is truly deplorable. You can tell he doesn't think he's gonna make it out the next day. 
In all reality, he had every right to question that. Uh, he, his men fought doggedly that day, but they'd been steadily stung by this group of hornets that was just not going to let up. Uh, water so close at Bushy Run just was not to be had. It was literally choking the life out of his troops. Uh, but even in this desperate situation, Bouquet was not going to give up. Uh, it was char characteristic of this man. He began to plan for what he knew was going to happen in the next, the next day. His only hope was in order to get the enemy out in the open where they weren't using the, the uh, cover of the trees and the brush and things provided for him. He needed to be able to put his massed fire, firepower against these troops in the open. Uh, he had actually counseled Major Grant into trying to use a tactic like this before Grant's defeat during the Forbes campaign. He still felt this tactic had merit, and this was an opportunity for him to try to put it into action. Uh, he basically was going to feign a retreat. He was going to make the Indians think that they had accomplished what they were going to do. They were going to retreat in through that little opening at the back of that formation that the natives left for him. The natives were going to be a rush in, take prisoners, a lot of havoc, and get a lot of plunder. So what he did was he had two companies on each side open the ranks so these first two companies of light infantry would retreat and look like they were running away. Basically what they did was they went to the back side of the hill and they hid there. Uh, a third light company, Grenadiers from the 42nd, and the, and the Rangers also moved around to the left of this formation, unseen on the back side of the hill. The barbarians mistaking these motions for a retreat hurried headlong and advancing upon us with the most daring intrepidity galled us successively with their heavy fire. But the very moment that they thought that they had taken the day, all of a sudden the first two companies that had hidden on the back of the hill sallied out. The natives were now out in the open and they hit them with a devastating volley of, of musket fire. Um, the other companies, along with the rangers, then all of a sudden also hit the Indians on the right flank. Uh, were from that part of the hill that they didn't see this coming from. They resolutely returned to fire, but they could not withstand the shock of all of a sudden having two volleys fired in them, not only in their front, but also in their flank. Uh, they killed many of them, and they put the rest to flight. Uh, this is another great one. Uh, the light companies have begun their counterattacks uh, against the natives. Uh, you can really, this was vicious, vicious fighting that happened during this section of the, of the battle on the second day. Just as quickly as that, that attack on the right flank happened, the natives began to, to flee. Uh, he sent orders for the other two companies were delivered. Uh, that so timely by that that all this happened in such an accurate amount of time uh, that they received their their full fire when they were uncovered by the trees. Uh, the four companies did not give them time to load a second uh, time, nor to even look behind them, but pursued them until the natives were totally dispersed. Uh, the natives on the left were really stuck just looking at what was happening over on the front and the right flanks. Uh, they were unable able to assist their, their brothers. All they could do was run also. Uh, being a witness to their defeat, they followed their example and fled. Uh, this is a, is a blow up of that, that uh, diagram that um, Hutchins had made. You can see these first two companies in their feigned retreat back into the center of the hill. And then the Grenadiers, the Rangers, and the other light companies where they were attacked. They sallied back out to here. They fired in the front of the natives and all of a sudden on, all on, the, on the native's right flank also. It was just too much of a shock for them to withstand. Uh, some historic, historians have tried to give Lemuel Barrett credit for this attack, and I'm sure he probably helped. But Bouquet had um, advocated this for years since coming to North America. Uh, so it really, the, the credit really goes to Bouquet and his men who were able to carry it off. Uh, the woods now being cleared and the pursuit uh, 
of the natives, the natives basically vanished. Uh, now it was time to try to make some sense of what had happened. Um, he had to make letters for his wounded. Uh, most of the flour that he had carried all that way across Pennsylvania for the relief of Fort Pitt, he had to destroy. He needed what horses he had left to carry his wounded. Uh, so other than another short, real quick attack, they were able to make the stream at Bushy Run where they set up another defensive fortification, began to care for the wounded, and the men were finally, after two days of intense fighting, were able to rest and refresh, refresh themselves. But it had to have been really devastating to have to destroy all those supplies that they had brought forward all that way. It would be another four days before they would actually finally stagger into Fort Pitt. Uh, once at Fort Pitt, he sent a strong 400-man body back to Fort Ligonier. Again, having those supplied fortifications behind him, he had supplies and men back there. He was able to still resupply Fort Pitt. Uh, the siege had been lifted and the lines of communication from all the way from Philadelphia out to Fort Pitt had been restored. Uh, but work remained to be done. Uh, the war was far from being over. The fort was in horrible shape. But now at least the siege had been lifted and the, the defenders could breathe a sign of relief. In typical fashion, he didn't take uh, the glory of the victory for himself. Uh, the beha behavior of the troops on this occasion speaks for itself so strongly that for me to attempt their eloquium would but detract from their merit. He knew that his men, even though it was his orders and his, his plans, they had really carried the day for him. Uh, in 1764, even though Fort Pitt had been relieved, uh, Fort Detroit, the siege was lifted there also. Uh, the natives were still in, a, in, a, in full rebellion. Um, he was ordered to march into the Ohio country and actually try to force the, the natives to, to end this rebellion for good. Uh, he marched in a very strong formation just that he, he always had and he marched right into the, the heart of their country and he was able to force them to come and they would eventually treat for peace uh, and return all their captives. Pontiac's rebellion was effectively order, or over after this march into the Ohio territory. Uh, the only problem is for all the great things that Henry Bouquet had done in North America. His career was very, very short-lived. In 1765, he was promoted to the rank of British uh, Brigadier General. It was a rule in the British Army that no foreign-born person, remember he was a Swiss mercenary, could achieve such a high rank. It was a testament to the honor of Henry Bouquet that the British Army gave this rank to him. Uh, he was placed in charge of the newly acquired garrisons in Florida. Uh, that were given to the British, uh, uh, to England, at the Treaty of Paris in 1763 that ended the French and Indian War. Uh, he arrived there in August to begin in this new stage of his career. But what the French and the Indians could not accomplish, sickness could. Uh, he caught malaria and passed away on the 2nd of September in 1765. So he was only here just a little over 10 years, or actually not even 10 years. Uh, but the amount of what he accomplished, I mean, this, this was really a brilliant military man. Thank you. And I, I have no idea how long it took, but I know it took a long time. <laughs> so, um, like I said, if anybody has any questions, I know there's a lot of stuff on the schedule that you want to see. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them right now. Or I'm right over here in the, this uh, other tent. I'll be here all day and all day tomorrow. I'll be happy to talk as long as anybody wants to. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, great presentation. Thank uh, you. Could you uh, articulate, when you reference Native Americans, of course, that's a very complex question. Yes. So when you, when you talk about you know, the French having support of Native Americans, who will be talking about, about the Native Americans? And the same question really applies when Pontiac, who actually stayed in Detroit, when that whole force moved forward to take these forts, who were we talking about in terms of the Native Americans? 
most of the forces that attacked Fort Pitt, um, more to the, I, even though it's Pennsylvania, they would kind of call it the southern frontier of the war. Um, you're talking about Delaware, Shawnees, the tribes that were in this area, most of your Ohio tribes. There, there's a ton of, the problem with, with, with tribes of Native Americans over the years is the English kind of, um, I hate to say this, but bastardize who they were and things like that. You would hear them called Mingos. That was a lot of your Shawnee tribes, your Delawares. Um, there were probably at least 10 different sub-tribes that were part of Pontiac's rebellion around the Fort Pitt area, Virginia, Pennsylvania. When you travel north more, you would have your Hurons, your, your native tribes of the lakes, um, parts of your Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, your Senecas and things like that would actually fight for the Americans later on in the Revolution. But you definitely, the farther end of New York that you got, you definitely had uh, parts of the Iroquois Confederacy that started to splinter and, and supported the, the, the natives there as well as the French. Um, so a, a huge number of tribes. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to, to name them all. Uh, but Delaware, Shawnee, um, some of your displaced um, tribes from New York that the Iroquois Confederacy had, had pushed out into Pennsylvania. That was what uh, the main tribes that were part of this. Um, Pontiac, they call it Pontiac's Rebellion. Pontiac was just a small, small portion. Um, again, history talks about the people that are well known. Uh, but he really was just a small part of this entire rebellion. Why was he assassinated? He made a lot of enemies uh, during the course of, of this rebellion. Um, he never was able to rise back to the prominence that he had during this rebellion. And they lost a lot. A lot of the different tribes up around Fort Detroit lost a lot of their warriors and some very important chiefs, and it was he was never forgiven for that. Yes, sir. Wasn't uh, Pontiac's rebellion tied to a religious movement uh, in the Indian community, and that really was quite a reinforcement of, of the, the joining of, of the Indians yeah. that hadn't occurred much before. There was, a, and you'll see this several times during. Um, confederacies, whenever you see the natives rise up to where they have some success, even though in the end they were not able to resist the encroachment of, of, of white settlers on their lands and things like that, whenever that they've enjoyed any success, it's usually when they've able, been able to confederate or come together. There was a movement that, that occurred that was happening for a few years just prior to um, the, the outbreak of Pontiac's Rebellion, where they were promoting getting back to the basics of how the natives lived. They didn't want to depend on guns. They wanted to go back to the bows and arrows. They wanted to go back to stone tools. They didn't want to rely on the English trade goods in order to make a living. They didn't want to have any attachment to the to the white settlements at all. The French, usually because the French didn't treat them the way that the, the English did, the French were more interested in living with them more harmoniously and trading with them than the English did. The English wanted land. The French, not so much. So Pontiac actually jumped on this movement. And I apologize, I, I know the name. Nolan. Yes, and I was going to say. Nolan. And, and, Nolan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was gaining so much ground in starting to, to organize this that Pontiac jumped on that movement, and that was how he was able to get a lot of his initial support and response for this rebellion. Basically, what they wanted to do was just push the English off, 
revert back to the ways that they, they had known forever. And it was also, you mentioned a religious um, uh, context. Pontiac really promoted that the Great Spirit wanted them to drive the English away, and then this would enable them to go back to their, their type of living that they should be living. And then that, and that the Great Spirit, if they did this, was going to reward them with that return to, to that style of life, you know. Uh, the Confederation has it, had its success because of that, but you get that many tribes together and things like that was probably a lot of the downfall also. So being, you know, not having a strict military organization within the Native American tribes, you've got a lot of factions that you know, uh, the greatest strength of a native warrior is the able, ability to fight as an individual. And so when you try to bring them together that they needed, it makes it tough. <laughs> the big thing was supply chain. Yes, that's yes. That's why they were so successful. Yeah. And that's why the British were so successful, yeah. because they were able to fight through the seasons where the Native Americans had to return. Yes, to yes. Their people and their Yeah, there's actually a, a theory. I. I don't know where uh, it's coming from, uh, but I actually kind of lend some credibility to it. Um, even though Bouquet at the Battle of Bushy Run was able to get them out in the open and hit them with some real devastating volleys and drive them off, typically your casualty numbers are still pretty low. And it always kind of surprised me that even if they took some pretty good casualties, why they didn't regroup, I mean, they had devastated his command. Why they didn't regroup and start sniping it and hitting them with his, their tried and true tactic of, of hit and run, they still had a way to go to Fort Pitt yet. There was a theory that they were out of ammunition. If you study the siege of Detroit, Pontiac and the tribes up there were able to take supplies from some of the traders and also intercept some supplies that were trying to come into the fort. So they were being resupplied with ammunition. When you look at the siege of Fort Pitt, they had been carrying on that siege with that pretty heavy small fire for quite a little while, but you don't hear about them getting resupplied. So it may have been that they just didn't have the ammunition to continue to do that. Like I said, I, I haven't found any proof, but you think about it, it's a possibility. Yeah. So. Um, I'd like to interject, uh, if you want to go to the next event, you got 10 minutes. Yeah, I was going to say, I, 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 I knew I was going to run long because if somebody doesn't stop me, I'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> you know?